Hey everyone, it's Megan. Welcome back to my channel. Welcome to my channel if this is your first time here. Today's video is going to be the start of a series I think that I'm going to do uh, about research. And these are going to be tips tailored toward occult research, so witchcraft, polytheism, paganism, different things of the sort. But Hopefully, these particular tips can translate over to other areas of your life too. But knowing how to do research and having some tools in your tool belt, so to speak, I think are very good skills to have um, for anyone that's either coming into witchcraft or paganism or even someone that's been here for a while. So this video might be one that you want to take notes for. I'm going to leave a lot of links in the description for um, different things that I'm going to talk about. And it's probably not going to be the most visually appealing video, but you know, that's okay. One of my main goals behind creating this channel in the first place is to help people help themselves, um, especially when it comes to witchcraft and paganism. I'm getting back in touch with that particular goal of this channel with this series on witchcraft research tips and tricks. This particular video is going to focus on something called the CRAP method. And I know it sounds funny, but it's C-R-A-A-P. And it is a tool that can be used to evaluate um, whether or not your source is reputable or even um, relevant to whatever you're trying to do. So the CRAP method was developed by someone named Sarah Blakesley from the University of California, Chico. It was developed by her and her team of librarians to help students evaluate the trustworthiness of their sources. It's mainly used in academic studies and um, settings, I guess, where students are having to write research papers and cite their sources and make sure that their sources are reputable and trustworthy for whatever they're researching. But I definitely feel like the CRAP method could be applied to a lot of occult topics too. Now the CRAP method is an acronym. It stands for Currency, Relevance, Accuracy, Authority, and Purpose. And I want to go through each of those items and talk a little bit about how to evaluate for that particular topic, such as currency, and how we can apply that to our research within witchcraft and paganism. So the first word in the CRAP method is currency. This is going to be when the book was published. As we go through these, uh, I will periodically be looking down. I have an entire sheet of notes and I don't want to miss anything. So the first word in the CRAP method is currency. And this is going to be, when was your source published? Um, has it been updated or revised? And if it's an online source, are the links functional? Do the links lead to reputable sources themselves? Um, as we go through this video, I'm mainly going to be talking about books because I feel like that's where a majority of us get our information from. But this acronym can be applied to any source, including those that are online, uh, documentaries, etc. So with currency, the, the main thing that you're going to look at is when it was published. If it was published a long time ago, has it been updated? Normally, older books are a product of their time. They may contain racist ideas, gender essentialism, homophobia, and transphobia. It's, we have to look at those types of books through that particular lens. And when it comes to historical data, new information might be available. So I think if you're looking for historical information that is accurate and up to date, you're gonna want to choose a more recent publication. A good example of checking the currency of a book within our particular niche of publishing would be Drawing Down the Moon by Margot Adler. Now, I, I'm about to find it. Um, the original was published ooh, in the 80s, I think. Let me find out. Okay, so here, because this is a new edition that I have, um, that I haven't finished reading. 
Um, the first edition of Drawing Down the Moon was published in 1979. This particular version is a new edition, so it contains revisions. And there is an entire, I think that's what I have bookmarked back here. Okay, there's an entire section at the back. The writing is really small, so I don't think that you can see it. Um, that contains notes. And these are notes from the revision. So you can actively see how the author has changed um, their perspective maybe, or how new information is available by corresponding what was written then with what is written now and reading the notes from the revisions and from the change. And I wanna point out here too, I have some um, considerations, I would say, some caveats to this particular method. Always extra things to keep in mind when researching and going about this. When it comes to the currency of the book that you're reading, just because it's old doesn't mean it's bad. And just because an author has written 30 years ago with some gender essentialism or some transphobia or some racism doesn't necessarily mean that they haven't changed. I am of the opinion I like to give people the benefit of the doubt and if an author wrote 30 years ago with some racist ideals or some homophobic ideals, if they write a new book I am likely to skim it it's a whole nuanced topic because if the author has proven themselves to be problematic through the entire time, then no, I'm not going to read their book. But, you know, if there have been changes, if new perspectives have been written about by that author, that was a weird way to put that. Um, if they have changed, then I am more likely to read their work. I think just about everybody has the capacity for change and it isn't always the right thing to judge someone based on what they wrote 30 years ago. The next letter is R and R stands for relevance. This one's going to be subjective because it's going to depend a lot on what you're researching but relevance is basically is what you're reading is the material that you're consuming relevant to your topic and especially within our sphere of information does it meet your needs and your particular skill level and who is the intended audience. So something that happens sometimes when someone comes into the community and they're trying to research uh, very complex, complicated and hard to digest topics, they automatically wanna dive into source material. And that's great, I, that's a fantastic place to start, but it's not always great for beginners because if you have no context behind what you're researching jumping into source material might give you a headache because it might be hard to read you might not understand what it is that you're reading and it might make you abandon the subject altogether so in cases like that you will want to find more foundational books that sort of give a summary give you background information background information and context about what you're reading. That is sort of the basis of relevancy, I think, when it comes to the craft method within witchcraft spaces. So you want to keep that in mind. Is the source that you're consuming relevant to your topic? I'm reading a book right now. Um, I'll probably, I might do a review on it, but I'm reading the book Empty Cauldrons by Terence Ward. And it says it's like navigating depression through ritual and spirituality or something like that. But I'm not finding that to be the case so far. So it's kind of relevant to what I was expecting, but not entirely. Another thing you want to keep in mind is your skill level. Are you a beginner trying to jump right into, um, you know, source material for Wicca, Gardner's Book of Shadows? Um, are you an advanced practitioner reading beginner books? If you're wanting to learn about something, you want to make sure that what you're reading, what you're consuming, matches your skill level. Here's an example. Um, I homeschool my daughter and she is, we're doing math. 
right? And she's learning fractions. I can't immediately jump in and have her learn how to turn decimals into fractions if we haven't done the decimals yet. She's learning to understand fractions, but she's not going to understand the decimal part of turning a decimal into a fraction, right? It's the same thing. You have to have the foundational context behind what you're learning in order to understand it properly. So the same thing can be applied to just about everything. I hope that made sense. Oh, and there's also a very big difference between reading occult books um, that are popularly published versus reading academic texts. I can read an occult book like nothing. Sit down, I can, especially if I'm interested in it, I can just read it. An academic text is one that is more, usually more complex, more detailed, and I have to read those in small chunks if I'm ever going to digest the information and retain it uh, for future educational purposes. The next letter in our acronym is A, and this one stands for authority. When we talk about authority within source material, what we're talking about or what I'm talking about, I can't speak for anybody else. What the method is talking about is who wrote your source? Who created the source? Who published it? Uh, what sort of credentials do they have? What sort of experience do they have? What are their qualifications? And this one can be a bit difficult to ascertain within the witchcraft world of books because we cannot judge someone else's experience and their qualifications, not usually. I make it a point, I guess, for myself, not to judge someone else's experience. It's their experience, it's fine. However, I think if someone is writing a book, then they should be able to at least explain their experience and if they have any qualifications. If someone is claiming to be part of clergy, uh, legally part of clergy, then they should have the information to back that up. One thing you have to consider when considering the authority of a source is does the person know what they're talking about? And that's gonna be hard to tell if you don't have any background experience in what it is that you're reading. This is where having a community comes in handy. Um, I will leave a link in the description to Ari, the Oak Witch, um, her Discord server, the Library of Mysteries. It is an entire Discord server dedicated to occult, witchcraft, um, and pagan books book vetting, um, book reviews, get recommendations, ask questions, things like that. I will leave that link in the description um, because I think it's an amazing resource to have, especially if you're coming into the community and you're looking for something specific and you don't know where to start. But an example of an author having authority to speak on a subject, in my opinion, is like... Um, if I'm reading a book on shadow work, or if I'm reading a book that mentions shadow work, I have the background information to know that shadow work is psychological. So if the book that I'm reading doesn't mention psychology and Carl Jung in regard to shadow work, then I will immediately question their knowledge of shadow work because it is foundational to shadow work, that information that it comes from psychology. And then you want to also check the uh, ties that an author or publishing company might have to outside groups. There is a problem in the pagan community. Uh, most people point to the Norse community, but it happens in a lot of pagan communities where authors are tied to hate groups or they have racist and folkist beliefs. And that it 100% informs their writing. And uh, those are books that I would recommend if you wanna read them, getting them secondhand so that we don't support problematic people in our community. But again, it's gonna be difficult for you to ascertain that without a community at hand and people who know that information ahead of time and can point you to evidence of that or unless you research authors on your own and you can find that information for yourself. But the authority of a source largely is going to be based on that source's experience, their education, and any sort of qualifications they might have. Harder to tell 
in the witchcraft community. One sign that the author is going to be trustworthy is if they lay out their experience for the reader, in this case, if we're talking about books. And what I mean by this is, for example, in Weaving Word, Wis Weaving Word Wisdom by Aaron Rowan Laurie, they say, uh, I have it quoted, I have part of the quote here. It says, I am not a scholar. I don't have a degree or any formal higher education. I don't have a physical copy of this book yet. I'm reading it on Scribd. But this book is full of the author's research, sources, and they lay it out there right from the beginning that they're not a scholar, but they have a love of research and uh, reconstructionist information and they give all of their sources for the reader to go find more information on their own. Um, so that makes me trust the author a little bit more. The next letter A that we have is going to be accuracy. And again, this is going to be one that is more difficult to do if you're only reading one book. You have to be able to cross check your information. If something is stated as fact, it needs to either have a source or have evidence of it online. It's very important to know the difference between facts, beliefs, opinions, and experience. Because most witchcraft books are going to have a, a blend of all of those, and sometimes more. And what separates a fact from a belief is that a fact can usually be proven. I can tell you for a fact that the sky is blue outside. I can prove it. I can tell you that I have a belief in witchcraft. I can't prove to you that it exists, but it's my belief. I can tell you that I have the opinion that tea light candles are better than chime candles. It's not really an opinion I hold. It's just an example. Um, and then I can tell you that my experience with Bridget is multifaceted. Those are four different Four different things? Those are four different things that authors might write about in their books. And it's important to be able to distinguish between those. So anything that's written as fact, or even anything that's brought up in a book that is scientific or historical in nature, should either have a source or you should be able to prove it. And I have two different examples here. So the first example is from Year of the Witch. And this is an example of a scientific claim without a source that also isn't backed up by evidence when I researched this particular topic. It says, there are a number of scientists who believe that due to the Milankovitch cycles, the global warming theory is actually a series of events that takes place every few thousand years and cannot be prevented. This argument posits that due to these factors of eccentricity, axial tilt, and precession, humans have little influence over the current cycle the Earth is going through. There's no source for that in this particular text, and on preliminary internet searches from reputable sources like NASA, and other scientific sources, this particular belief that the author is claiming some scientists hold has been proven to be false. The next example I have is one of a historic nature. Um, it is in the Sacred Isle, Belief in Religion in Pre-Christian Ireland by <sighs> Dahi O'Hogan. I think I said that right. <laughs> I, asked, uh, I asked beforehand, so hopefully I did the author justice. Um, but I just flipped open to a random page in this book because I'm not done reading it. And I found this particular paragraph um, on the use of tradition. I believe this is in like chapter seven. Uh, it's on page 201 for anyone that's interested. It says, as one would expect, the Christian missionaries strongly opposed the practice of rituals which they understood to be incompatible with their own ideology. We have seen how Patrick himself alluded to one such ritual which he found demeaning and to which, at his own peril, he refused to submit. In time, the Christians extended their objections to substantial parts of the social order. Within a few generations, church ordinances were forbidding clerics to appeal to secular judges and significantly condemning the Christian who swears before a seer like the pagans. And this has a little number next to it, 76. And that points to, oh, let me go back here. 
It points to the notes, which points you to a source. De Peor, 1993, page 135 through 136. So then if you go back here to the bibliography, we can find the book that the author is referencing is called St. Patrick's World, written by someone named Leon, Liam de Peor, um, Dublin, 1993. That is how something like that should be cited. It should have primary sources or uh, information that points to where the reader can verify what the author is saying. So again, when it comes to checking the accuracy of something, look at the sources that the author cites, do some research on your own if the author doesn't cite any sources, and extend the CRAP method to the sources that you're checking. The last letter in the CRAP method is P, and it stands for purpose. When it comes to researching witchcraft books, there are many different purposes. It could be to explain a particular practice. It could be to teach a practice, and with this I would expect there to be um, exercises, especially if it's about something like psychic ability or witchcraft. It could be to share experience. Some people write books just to share their own experiences within their system of belief, and that's okay. But it's important to know the difference, I think, between a book that is meant to be educational and a book that is just meant to share someone's experience. It's also important to know what the author's purpose is or at least see if you can figure it out. Is it meant to teach, persuade, entertain even? Are the author's intentions clear? Is the book fact, opinion, fiction, or even propaganda? Those are all things that you have to consider when looking at sources. And I included the word propaganda because while we might like to leave our rose-colored glasses on in this community, there are people out there who write propaganda for the sole purpose of keeping people out, so gatekeeping, or spreading their racist, homophobic, transphobic, whatever other phobics out there, belief systems. And that's very, very important. One book that I might lump in as um, TERFI propaganda, so trans exclusionary radical feminists. Is that what TERF stands for? Trans exclusionary radical feminists. I think that's what it stands for. Um, is the book Witch by Lisa Lister. In this book, the author says that the book will piss off trans people because the author claims that a person's magic, a person's witchcraft, and their power comes from their womb and their genitals. And in this case, they would be, can I say that word on you? I should be able to say that word on YouTube. Uh, in this case, it comes from the uterus and the vagina. And the book is awful. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I would consider that book turf propaganda because the author outright says that witchcraft and a person's power comes from their uterus and their vagina. And if you don't have a uterus or a vagina, then you're not as powerful as someone that has one. All of that being said, I have a few different things that I want you to consider when uh, researching within witchcraft and when using the craft method. And the first one is just because a book is old, or even if a book is brand new, doesn't mean it's good or doesn't mean it's bad. When reading through um, one of Doreen Valiente's books, Natural Magic, I think it is, we read it for book club on Patreon a while ago, um, we had to keep in mind that the book was written in the 70s and there was some information in the book that didn't really fit in with today's standards of gender, or not standards, uh, understanding of gender identity and gender within witchcraft. But that doesn't mean the book is bad. It just means we have to read the book through that particular lens of understanding. The same can be said about books that are newer. Just because it's new doesn't mean it's a good book. Doesn't mean it's a bad book either. But don't discount a source based on the currency of it. Don't discount the book based on when it was published. You just need to keep that in mind when you read it. It's also okay just to read a book to enjoy it. You don't have to read a book to learn everything from it. 
Some books you're going to learn a vast amount of information from and some books you're not going to learn anything from. But if you enjoyed it, it's still okay. I don't want anyone to feel like they have to read books and not enjoy them. And that leads me into my next one. If you're not enjoying the book that you're reading, it's okay to put it down. It's fine. Abandon it. Life is too short to read shitty books. <laughs> there's, you know, there's nothing else I can say about that. Life is too short to read awful books. Research skills take practice. So if you have never done any research in your life, it takes practice and you're not gonna get it right every time. But hopefully this video has given you some tips and some things to think about in terms of research. If you're not subscribed, make sure you subscribe because I do plan on turning this into a series with more research tips based on my own experience and education. So subscribe if you're not, if, if research is something that interests you. Um, but yeah, research takes practice. These are skills that have to be developed and you have to continually do them to get better. So don't feel bad if you're not good at research right now. If you've never done it before, it's fine. It takes practice. I also want to point out the importance of reading beyond your interests. And what I mean by this is read books written outside of your culture by those particular authors. Um, for example, say the, um, the Sacred Isle by Dahi Ohogan. It's a book about Ireland written by an Irish author. Um, on the other side of that, um, American Brujeria, written by J. Allen Cross. It's a book on Mexican-American magic written by a Mexican-American. It doesn't mean that you have to take in all of the information from those sources, but it is proven that having a better understanding of other cultures leads to less racism, hatred, and bigotry in the world, or at least with the person that's understanding what they're reading. So expand your horizons, learn about other cultures, and you don't have to learn about their practices with the point of doing what they do. But it's a good idea to learn about their practices just to learn about them. Now, the last two points I have here, the first one is that just because something is published in a book, written on the internet, set on the news or in a documentary or whatever, doesn't automatically make it true and doesn't automatically make it trustworthy. You always want to examine your sources of information, especially when it comes to educational material, academic material, um, science, you know, make sure you're getting your scientific information from actual scientists and historical information. It's important to know the source and to always read and consume educational material with a discerning eye. And then ask questions if you don't understand something. And again, this is where having a community is important. If you don't have anyone to go to and ask a question, you're not going to magically understand what it is that you're reading or you're consuming. It might leave you with more questions. So having a community that you can go to is very important when it comes to things like this. I am constantly utilizing the communities that I'm in for questions when I don't understand something. I mean, it's okay. Everybody's gonna have questions, especially if they're researching something they don't know about. So if you're not part of a community, I highly recommend you join one. I have a Discord server. The link for that is always in the description below. If you wanna join a book-related server only, then I will leave, again, the link to the Library of Mysteries Discord server in the description below. Branch out, make friends, ask your peers whenever you're confused about something. It's okay to ask questions, and it's vital to ask questions when you don't understand something. So thank you so much for watching this video. I know it wasn't the most visually appealing, but the information presented here, I think, is very important for anyone to know that is researching paganism, witchcraft, or polytheism. And this is just one of the tools that you have at your disposal. I will be making this a series. I have a lot more tips, a lot more useful information, I think anyway, um, about research in general and how that can be applied to witchcraft research 
If you have questions about research or you want me to make a, an entire video about a specific question you have, leave them in the comments below and I will do my best to answer them either in the comments or in an upcoming video. Again, if you want to be part of a community, you can find my Discord server in the description. If you'd like to help support the work that I do here around the cauldron with the channel, the podcast, the blog, all of that, you can join me on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month, get patron exclusive perks and stuff. Um, everybody on Patreon gets the same thing no matter your tier because it's like a sliding scale thing. And yeah. Again, check the links in the description. I will have links to more information about the crap method and the history and all of that. And I will see you in my next video. Bye.